All right, praise the Lord. We'll get started. Uh, thank you for those who endured the motocross to get in. <laughs> you need a medal. Yeah. Be careful, folks. I mean, really, just be careful, and especially when you leave tonight. Be very careful and go slow. Uh, so. Yes. All right. So, Father, we thank you tonight, God, that we have an opportunity to come. Uh, God, to study your word. Uh, God, to hear from you through your word. And God, be changed by your word. Lord, we open ourselves up for the Holy Spirit to speak to us tonight, God, as we dive into this study. And God, um, we endure to learn more about you and your ways and God, what you have in store for us and everything that we do. And Lord, I pray, God, for those that are uh, traveling your hand of safety be upon them. I pray for those, God, that are sick, uh, Lord, and, and are going through things. Uh, Lord, minister to them healing. Uh, God, and not just, uh, Lord, we, we don't want just to pray healing, God. We want to hear the report, God, of lives that have been healed by your power, God. We are, we are uh, <laughs> Lord, I, I don't want to say that we're tired of praying, but God, we are weary of not seeing results, God, and we want to see results, God, of our prayers. We want to see the manifestation of your wonderful works of healing power taking place in people's lives and God destroying sickness, destroying illness, and God destroying things that are destroying their life, God. We pray tonight, God, for our nation, uh, Lord, that is... <laughs> Is so divided, and God on every, and it seems like on every angle, Lord, we pray, God, for a manifestation of your spirit to take place in this nation, an outpouring and awakening, God, over this country like never before, like has never seen before. Lord, as I heard the other day, God, a, a word that was spoken from Pastor Seymour in 1906, and he said there would be another, God, you said there would be another revival that would take place, God, in this nation that would be greater than the others, and God would be uh, across all races. And God, we are crying out, let that time be right now, God, uh, let this be that hour. Let this be that revival that breaks loose for this nation. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We are here at 146. And we're talking about uh, because Paul was a Roman a citizen, the Romans, they had to take every precaution to safeguard their prisoner's life. And they decided, the centurion guard there, decided that the best thing to do was to send Paul by night to the city of Caesarea. Because as you remember, uh, Paul's nephew goes to the centurion and he tells them, hey, look, uh, these people... There are 40 assassins that have planned to take Paul out and they are trying to get you and lure you into a trap to bring Paul back down before the council. And if you, if you do that, they're going to take him out and they're going to assassinate him there. And they took a vow that they wouldn't eat or drink until they got it done. And so now the centurion uh, uh, guard who's in charge, this captain of the army that's there, he's now worried that if he does not protect Paul's life after Paul has declared himself as a Roman citizen, 
that what will happen is that the blood of Paul's life being lost if he's assassinated will be on his hands and he will be responsible for not protecting him as a Roman citizen. So they come up with this elaborate plan. What was this elaborate plan to escort Paul out of Jerusalem? Yep, 200, 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. When we look into the verse 23, and it says, And it called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen threescore, and ten, and spearmen 200 at the third hour of the night. The NLT says that the commander called two of his soldiers and ordered, Get 200 soldiers ready to leave Caesarea at 9 o'clock tonight and take 200 spearmen and 70 mounted troops. What happened here is the commander's assignment of 200 soldiers uh, with the centurions, perhaps this is a, a small contingent, but we don't know, uh, but it says two Two centurions might command 160 troops in practice to guard Paul. Think about how they are taking such great precautions. 160 people, but if we look at it, it's really, it's 470 that are actually committed to protecting Paul just to get him to Caesarea. That's how, that's how intent they were to make sure that he had a safe travel and to make sure to guard Paul. Uh, now, when you take out that many troops out of that garrison, what potentially happened was is they now weakened their defense for the city of Jerusalem by a significant amount. So, we know that... Um, they, they took these people out of the garrison in Jerusalem's fortress of Antonio. Uh, they think it was probably at least by one-third of the troops that were there or stationed there. And 200 spearmen that it talks about, are these are non-Roman light auxiliary infantry. So not everybody would have had, you know, back then, not everybody had a bow, not everybody had... A sword, some had spears, some had swords, some rode on chariots, some on horses, all of those things. And it says, if the if the Antonio Corhart in, included a regular cavalry unit, which this apparently did, it had as many as 100 horsemen. So the entire cavalry of Antonio's fortress was now in the escort of a prisoner to another jail facility. That tells you how important it was. Now, do you not think that this is somewhat providence that God wanted to make sure that Paul was spared and that Paul stayed alive at least to get to Caesarea so he could testify, at least so he could get to Rome so he could testify? You see, God makes providence and God makes plans and God takes provision for our lives if we walk in Him. We will accomplish, I believe, what God has called us to accomplish if we will walk in the paths and the ways that God has called us to walk. And it says that, that by taking this much out, given the unrest that was in uh, Palestine at that time and the night attacks by the robbers, a smaller contingent that says would not, would not be safe in the hills of Judea at night. It was a rough neighborhood. Uh, the Roman pure creator or governor uh, resided in Caesarea uh, because that's where 
Uh, that's where their quarters were established, uh, heritage established quarters there even. Um, they had built this up. It was a port. It was a natural port. It was an elaborate port uh, when they got done with it, uh, including the large, a large uh, theater, a large uh, chariot racetrack, a large harbor that was built into the Mediterranean Sea. I mean, you name it, they, they didn't waste any money. This was the place. So they, he, he resided there. The, the governor would only come down to Jerusalem at the time of major feast to make sure and be on site to keep the peace because it appeared that during the uh, the feast, whenever the Jewish feasts were, that's when a lot of the civil unrest took place. So um, this was also the military headquarters uh, of the Romans for Judea. Uh, and what we do know is that the Roman overseer for all of Syria, Palestine, uh, we know that they resided, the overall uh, governor resided in Syria. So they left about 9 p.m. and only protracted march would get them well on their way overnight. So it, it was going to take a, a pretty good march to get them there to Caesarea. Uh, it seems like to me from, from Jerusalem that would be a pretty good hike. Uh, when you're talking about leaving from from other places, uh, it's it's not quite as bad. But from Jerusalem, it would be a pretty good hike to get to Caesarea. So, we he takes off, uh, escorted by these 470 uh, soldiers, and 147. It says according to the letter that was sent to Felix, the governor of Caesarea. We're looking at verses 25 through 30. How did the Roman captain feel about Paul's charges? He didn't think they de uh, that he deserved uh, death or imprisonment. Okay. D didn't think they deserved death or imprisonment. Bogus. Yes, Dave? Oh, I'm just flipping my pen. Just flipping your pen. Okay. So... So what, what actually is, the, the, the captain doesn't feel that there was anything that warranted death or bonds. When we look in the verses that are there in verse 29, it says, uh, whom I perceive to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. The NLT says, I soon discovered the charge was something regarding their religious law, certainly nothing worthy of imprisonment. So I want you to, to remember how the, the captain has documented in his letter what he believes is actually taking place and what the accusations are that they are accusations against Jewish law, okay? And there was nothing that warranted any kind of death or bonds. And the letter he wrote states that this appears to state that this was a dispute over religion and had nothing to do with Roman law being violated. So, When we get to 148, it says, Who was Felix going to wait for before he heard Paul's defense? Paul's accusers. He had to wait for the accusers. And is, is that something, uh, where do you see that currently? I mean, we, we have that same uh, right that's built into our form of law that we are able to confront those who accuse us in a criminal procedure. 
We have the right to meet our accusers or at least know who they are. They cannot be kept a complete secret. Okay? This, that law that we have, those rights, came birthed out of what was Roman law. So he has, uh, he has his right to meet his accusers. 35, I will hear thee, uh, said he, when thine accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. And I will hear your case, the NLT says, when, my, uh, when your accusers arrive, the governor told him, then the governor ordered him kept in the prison at Herod's headquarters. So it's interesting. Is so he's waiting. The letter. The letter is uh, from the captain. Is hey, look, Paul didn't really. We don't think Paul did anything wrong. The only thing that we're seeing is uh, Paul may have violated some Jewish law. Uh, it's their. It's their problem. It's their law. It's not anything that obstructs. It's not anything that goes against Roman law. And so he's now in a position. He's already given his opinion to the governor of what's going on. But now when Paul arrives in Caesarea, Felix locks him up anyway. Yeah. Now, did Felix lock him up because he wanted to keep Paul safe? Did Felix lock him up because he thought Paul must have been guilty of something? You are a quiet group tonight. I... Or a small group. So you know, here you think about that. So he's he's locked him up. I believe personally, I believe Fields locked him up because he already knew that it took Roman guards to get him there. And until he can make a judgment of innocent or guilty, he could not release him because what would have happened? Paul possibly would have been murdered by the assassins, which would have been on his head back to the Roman government, right? Back to Caesar. Uh, this could have caused a major civil unrest when people would not get the judgment or the verdict that they were hoping for without ever hearing a case. So Felix, I believe, acted in his best judgment to wait at least until he could hear the accuser's case before Paul, even though he had already been presented a letter that this had nothing to do with breaking Roman law. He was going to do uh, what he thought was probably the best thing to do to keep Paul alive. And guess what? Felix was probably doing what was best to keep him alive. Not a lot's changed in politics. So he's waiting on his accusers. And it says, when the cavalry and Paul arrived, Felix held a minor, he holds, he holds a, a minor preliminary interrogation. Uh, I don't know, uh, I know, I don't know what that exactly in, entailed, but it says Felix was the purgator or the governor of Judea from about AD uh, 52 to 58. And he is one of three Roman uh, governors mentioned in the New Testament. The others are Pontius Pilate and Portius Festus. Felix married uh, Drusilla, a sister of Herod Agrippa II, the Agrippa that is in chapter 25, verses 13 to 26. And after Felix learned Paul was from uh, Cilicia, 
he determined to hear the case. Evidently, a case could be tried in the providence or province of the accused or in the province in which the alleged crime took place. And the question actually involved what sort of province then was Paul from? Because at this time, Cilicia was not a full province, but was under the uh, authority of Syria, for whom Felix was only a deputy governor. Uh, the governor would not want to be bothered, the, the full governor of that area would not want to be bothered with such a small case as this. Furthermore, Felix would not want to incur the Jews' wrath by forcing them to present their case against Paul in his hometown of Tarsus, a city so far away. So Felix could make only one decision, and that was to hear the case. But witnesses against Paul would have to be present. Now we go to chapter 24. And so how long did it take? Uh, how long did Paul's accusers wait before they went to Caesarea? Five days. Five, five days. The NLT says five days later, Ananias, the high priest, arrived with some of the Jewish elders and the lawyer. Oh, so they brought a lawyer now. You know things are headed in the wrong direction then. They brought a lawyer and the lawyer, Tertullus, to present their case against Paul, the governor, and the governor, to the, to the governor. After five days from the time that Paul was come to Caesarea, the malice and the fury of the prosecutors was very great. They stick not at any travail of pains to do mischief, and surely we ought to be as earnest in doing good, or the zeal will condemn us. And it says that this, a certain orator or a lawyer, deformed, they brought this particular lawyer to form the indictment against Paul or to aggravate his fault, to desire judgment upon him. Such advocates usually were the chief orators. And uh, there are some that are listed that are from Greece and Rome. And Tertullus seems to have been a, a crafts master whom the Jews hired, whom the Jews hired to draw up an accusation against Paul. So they took five days before they go to meet Paul to make their accusation. And what do you think they're doing in five days? They've hired a lawyer and they're drumming up the accusation. They're trying to make sure that they can have the right story so that what now, what they know was probably sent to Felix was that this is a Jewish law problem. It's not a Roman law problem. And now what they're trying to do is to make sure that they can craft their indictment so it doesn't appear that it's just a Jewish law problem, but now it's, this guy's a Roman law violator. So, after the orator's overly uh, flattering introduction in verses 2, what, what did he say about Paul? You're on the right track. Oh, sect of whatever. Now. Desecrate. Now, huh? Desecrate. Desecrate the temple. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
he was getting ready to write him, so I just I said, interpreted it for you. Yeah. He, he's a pestilent fellow, a mover of seditions among all the Jews of the world, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, and he went about to profane the temple. Now, why, why do you think that that is important? Why do you think that this, the way that this has now been crafted for this indictment is important? Well, looks like a uh, pretty closed shut case and it's pretty serious. Well, insinuating riots well, would make it. Well, I think it would be one of them. Right. Yeah. So, so we have this certain orator named Tertullus, a lawyer. He's acquainted with the forms of Roman courts. He, he knows how Roman courts operate. Like, like any good lawyer, they know how the system works. Uh, he's acquainted with the Roman courts. Some have supposed that he was not a Jew from his name, but it was probable that he was a Jew who had been educated in Roman law, perhaps at Rome. The name, the name signifies nothing. That of, uh, that of Paul was itself Roman. The, three, the first three verses of the address of Tertullus are, are compliments to Felix. That's, uh, think about that. So the first thing that this guy does is he... Was. The first thing that this lawyer does is he goes and he kisses up to the governor. Now, that's not the way the court should be held. Uh, so, he's intended to secure this favorable hearing because he's doing this. And in the fifth verse, the charges begin. The first one of which is false. And it is that he is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And so let me explain what that actually means. For hundreds of years, they, the Jews would use the term Nazarenes for the sect uh, or the Christians, instead of calling them Christians, they actually called them Nazarenes because Jesus was from Nazareth. So that's where that came from. And this was the offense of, of Paul. Uh, it says that he was a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And all their hatred was due to the fact that he was the great leader of this sect. The reason why this urge was to show that Paul preached a religion that was not authorized by Roman law. You understand, the Romans had made a deal with the Jews to authorize Jews to practice Judaism. Right? They allowed that to take place because if you, if you study enough of Roman history, you understand that Caesar thought himself to be a deity. Right, Tim? Some of them did. Yeah, if you're talking about Nero around this period, yes. Right, but but that the Senate itself even conferred that at points. Sure. So so that's where I, they they're at this point in time where they basically you know they were they believed in the gods, the mythology of of that time of the Greek mythology, the Roman mythology. They believed that uh, some of the emperors believed that they were a god themselves, but they've authorized. Judaism, the practice of Judaism to take place. And we all know why they 
authorized it because the Romans and the Jews, the leaders of the temple, the high priest who they were appointing as high priest, were all working in cohorts to get rich together. That's why. That's why they authorized it. That's why they said it was okay. So, now we call this sect the Nazarenes. The reason why this was, was urged was to show that Paul preached a religion that was not authorized by Roman law. And the Nazarenes was, uh, for hundreds of years, the term that was applied to Christians by Jews. And this is, uh, this is the only instance, however, in the New Testament New Testament where it is applied. It's the only time that we use that or, or see that term. And the Mohammedans they still use that term, it says. Um, and it says that he, the next charge is that he hath gone about to profane the temple. And this came, this false charge is repeated because this was the cry when Paul uh, was seized. And note that there are three charges that Paul was the author of sedition, uh, preached an unlawful re uh, religion, that Paul was the author, uh, uh, or that Paul preached an unlawful religion. He profaned the temple. The penalty of, uh, of the last by Jewish law was death. And the Romans usually permitted it to be enforced when someone profaned the temple because why they didn't want to upset the train the gravy train that was working on their behalf they wanted to keep those that were in leadership in the church happy even though we know that in 70 a.d the temple was profane uh, Whom we took, it says, whom we took and would have judged. This part of the sixth verse of all of the seventh and the first clause of the eighth are not found in, in revisionist forms of the scripture. And in the common version becomes him and the revisionist force. And it says, and the Jews joined in the charge. Those who had come down from Jerusalem affirmed that Tertullus had spoken the facts. So now we know that Paul... Uh, Paul has his accusers. He has a lawyer that's presented these charges, and they are going after him on these grounds. Because what has he done? They are they've changed what their original charges were, so they could line them up to match that Paul had violated Roman law. So now they knew that if they did not do that with a lawyer's advice that they were never going to get anywhere with Paul. Paul would have been turned loose. But now if we can turn the tables and we can make it look like that he's violated Roman law, these charges might stick. Now, none of that ever happens today, but... It says the accusations were, I'm going to go over them again, the accusations were, number one, Paul was a worldwide troublemaker. Uh, stirring up riots everywhere. Two, he was a leader of the Nazarene sect. And three, he attempted to desecrate the temple. The first charge had political overtones because Paul desired to maintain order throughout its, uh, or Rome desired to maintain order throughout its empire. That was, their, that was their main thing. They wanted order. They wanted peace. Uh, it was, if they didn't keep peace in their province, uh, that governor uh, paid a pretty heavy price. The second charge was also concerned with the government because Tertullus made it appear that Christianity was divorced from the Jewish religion, entirely separated, and Rome permitted Judaism as a, a religio uh, lictia, or a legal a religion, but it would not tolerate any new religions. They, they had not made a good enough deal, Christianity had not made a good enough deal with the Romans 
to be allowed. Um, but it would not tolerate any new religions. And by describing Christianity as a sect, uh, a faction of the Nazarenes, the attorney made Paul's faith appear to be cultic and bizarre. Desecrating the temple also had political overtones because the Romans had given the Jews permission to execute any Gentile who went inside the barrier of the temple. And at this point, Tertullus modified the original charge made in verse uh, in chapter 21 and 28, where Paul was accused of bringing the Gentile, Trophimus, the Ephesian, into the temple courts. And here Paul is said to have attempted desecration. The truth was severely damaged in the clause, so we seized him. The implication being they took Paul to arrest him. They were at all costs willing to do whatever it took to make sure they could try to silence Paul. And to send him, I mean, I don't think they really wanted to send him to jail. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to make sure if they could approve, hey, he desecrated the temple, uh, that's a penalty worthy of death, and they could approve that case, that's what their intent was, and they would have gotten the blessing of the Roman government. One fifty one. Paul flatly stated that the accusations were false in verses 11 to 13. You're absolutely right. Linda Ryder uh, wrote, she said, Felix knew of the Lord and teachings, but he was a coward and afraid of the Jewish people. And he turned away from the greatest thing that could have come into his life by being a coward and not wanting to incur the wrath of the Jews. Paul flatly stated that the accusations were false in verses 11 to 13. But he did admit or to confess the two things. What are they? Okay. Huh? Yeah. Huh? Yep. So, so the the answer is already worship God, believing in the law and prophets, and B, believed in the resurrection of the dead. When we look in in twenty four eleven to thirteen, it says because thou that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. The NLT says, And you can quickly discover that I arrived in Jerusalem no more than twelve days ago, to worship at the temple, my accusers I never found me arguing with anyone in the temple, nor stirring up a riot in any synagogue, nor in the streets of the city. These men cannot prove the things they accuse me of. And the 14th and 15th verses says, But this, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And I have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. The NLT says, 
but I admit that I follow the way which they call a cult. I worship the God of our ancestors, and I firmly believe the Jewish law and everything written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God that these men have, that he will raise both the righteous and the unrighteous. So what Paul has done is answering their charge. He is saying that, uh, yes, he believes in Christianity, believes in the way, but you have to understand uh, this, you guys call this a cult, but it's the same God. I believe in the same God that you believe in. It's the same Jehovah that you believe in. You just haven't accepted his son. You just haven't believed that the Messiah has come. The one that you have prayed about, the one that you have hoped for, the one that you've cried over, the one that you had, uh, uh, thought would come to save and to bring freedom and to, to release you from the Roman government and to separate you from the bondage of the Roman government and to bring that freedom you would hope for, you rejected and you crucified. And Paul's just trying to lay it out for him. Y yes, I believe in the way because guess what? I was blind, but now I see. My eyes were opened. I was once like you. I was once who was a, a prosecutor and a persecutor of the Christians. And I looked upon myself when I met the Lord and I was changed. And I have this hope. We have this hope. Of a resurrection. And Paul lays it out in a way that most of us don't think about. But there is a resurrection, he's saying, of the righteous mm -hmm. and the unrighteous. We'll all, you'll all, every, every single person will stand before Christ. Now, you could stand before him at the mercy seat. Oh, hallelujah, that's where I hope to be. That's where I believe I'll be. Or you could stand before him at the judgment seat. And that's, that's, going, to be, that's going to be a day. And we're going to know... When real judgment really takes place. It says the Roman lawyers also had uh, defenses for those who confessed their guilt. It says admitting that the deed was wrong. Uh, the, the Latin word or, or the, the Greek word is concessio. They could claim they meant well, and, and the Greek word is pregatio, or simply beseech pardon, but when Paul admits the deed, he does not admit that it's wrong or ask pardon for it. Instead, he creates a masterful defense. First, is this, this is an issue of internal Jewish law. He takes it right back out of the Romans' hands because he has now destroyed their argument that this is a new religion. It's not. It's the same God, the same Jehovah. <clears throat> not a crime under Roman law. And therefore, worthy neither of Roman trial nor of Roman execution at Jewish instigation. Further, the Christian faith springs from Old Testament and is thus an ancient religion which should be protected as a form of Judaism under Roman toleration. Confessing what was not a crime was a typical masterful rhetorical move and it would heighten one's credibility while doing nothing for the opponent's charge. The defendant had broken the law. Then we get to verse 15 and it says, Phariseeism and the rest of Judaism that believed in the resurrection 
of the righteous were divided on the resurrection of the wicked. Remember, now Paul, Paul has already gone in. He's already divided the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The guy, maybe, maybe he should have been a lawyer. I don't know. He was, he was skillful and he knew how to divide and conquer. It, he could get them to argue amongst themselves and take all of the shots off of himself. And so now what he's done is he's divided uh, uh, those over the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the wicked. And some believe that the wicked would be raised for judgment, either temporary torture followed by annihilation or eternal torture. Others believe that they would not be raised. And the early Christians uh, who comment on the matter accept a resurrection of the wicked to judgment. And it uses a reference of John chapter 5, verse 29, and Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5 as the most natural way to read Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. So, we get to 152. What did, what did Paul say he exercised himself to do? Always, to always have a clear conscience before God and man. Always have a clear conscience. Verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God. But it doesn't stop just there. It says, and toward man or men. Daniel T. says, because of this, I always try to maintain a clear conscience before God and all people. In other words, gosh, I don't want to be an offense to God, and I don't want to be an offense to anybody else. I mean, Man, would that verse preach today, Dave? I, I, you have to understand something, okay? Just, just to clarify this. When you speak the truth and the gospel truth, you are not the offense. But it's coming from you. No. That's true, it's coming from us, but you have to understand, what are they offended at? They're offended at the truth. They're offended at the word. They're not offended at you. Well, they don't want to hear the truth, but you're the messenger, so, you know, they don't I, look at it that way. I understand that, but you, you, have, you, have to, you have to remember the offense is not you, because what have we been called to do? Our... Our calling is to share the good news. And if that offends, well, they don't want to hear the truth. Well, because it doesn't match up to their narrative or what they believe. I understand that. You may, you know, some some may not may not want to hear the truth, doesn't match their narrative or what they believe. But you have to understand that well, there's too many. Murder, charm birth baby, and murder a human being like that. I mean, it, 
Because, because they've been taught a, a different ideology. ideology about what life is, and they've been taught a different ideology of when life begins. They've been taught a different ideology of what their rights are compared to to all persons rights that's what the difference is and our biggest problem that is taking place really quite frankly is is education mm -hmm. our 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 people are not educated oh they're being There are there are a lot of that. There's a lot of, of negative anti anti Christ. I'll just call it what it is. It's anti it's anti Christ teaching. Mm -hmm. And why why is that shocking to us? I'm not shocked. The Bible tells us in the last days there's going to be all kinds of anti Christ. Everybody's looking for, everybody's talking about looking for the, oh, is, is this one the Antichrist? Well, we've had them, we've had Antichrist clear back to the time of Peter. From the New Testament on, there have been Antichrist. Well, the opposite of God and what his word would be the Antichrist. So. Exactly. Exactly. We've had them. We've had them forever. I'm not, I'm not personally, I'm not worried about when the Antichrist shows up. I'm not looking for who he is or where he's coming from or, or anything else. I'm looking, I'm looking, my eyes are set on when the Christ shows up. Amen. And what do I got accomplished in, we're off the course now, but, but we'll go. And what have I got accomplished when he shows up? Have I fulfilled everything that he has called me to do? Have I done everything that I've been told that I'm supposed to do? Have I taken his word and have I lived it out before God and before man like I've been, like I've been called to do in his word? Have I fulfilled what he's told me to do? Because he said in his word, he said, you are commissioned to go to Jerusalem. You're commissioned to go to Judea. You're commissioned to go to Samaria. And guess what? Samaria, when he says Samaria in that scripture, you have to understand that was the enemy. That was the enemy's camp. They were the most detestable people to the Jews that they could have. They, they did not get along with the Samaritans because they considered them half-breeds. They considered them as, as, as a fallaway tribe that destined themselves off to another form of religion because they split off and they never got accepted back in. They, they never accepted them. They were like half-breeds to them. And so they, they had this entire vision, basically, of Jesus giving them a commission and telling him, look, you got to go to the people that you know in your neighborhood. you got to go to the people in your city. you got to go to the people in your state. you got to go even to the people that you don't like and the people you may not get along with and tell them about me. And then when you get all that accomplished, you need to go to the whole world. Because I'm commissioning you to go to the world to take this gospel and this message forward. We can't. And that's going to, honestly, that's going to be the big answer when Christ does show up and we stand before him. What did we do with the commission? What did you do in the Lord's army? Well, I peel taters. <laughs> but, I mean, that's that's where we're at. <laughs> Dave said he was permanently train orderly.
Absolutely. Right. Exactly. So, you know, I just, that's, to me, that's the biggest thing. It, you know, like, Dan, like you say, Dan says, we have, can't, it can't be, which I am a part of the thing, but we're not, it can't be, because they are acting the way they're supposed to act. Exactly. Regardless it, of it, like it or not. And, and here's, here's the main thing I'd tell people. Our commission was to go yeah. and, and to present the gospel. Is that correct? Guess what? After it's presented, the rest is on God. The rest is on the Holy Spirit. It requires the Holy Spirit to draw. But if we don't go, if we don't, if we don't do what we're called to do, it doesn't happen. And so, if we do what we're supposed to do, then God will do what he'll do. So, Paul killed by the sword, and today we can kill by the tongue. Isn't that what the book says? Life what? and death is in the power of the tongue. Yeah, life and death is in the tongue. I, I guarantee you that the tongue, the tongue is sharper than a sword. Uh, Dave, Dave's asking the question, how many people along life's journey have we killed with our tongue? Well, we're going to close the, we're going to close this down and we're all going to repent now. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what is it exactly he said to him. Was it really anything at all or was it really something that had hurt him? Or, uh, what, what was it we said that hurt him so badly? Yeah, offended him. Offended him. You know, um, it's hard to say because some people are just offended easily. Um <laughs> Um, so, I mean, seriously, some people just get offended easily. Yeah. Um, well, some people. They're pretty thin. My, my personality, I like, to, I, like, I like to joke around. And some people, they, they can't take a joke, man. I mean, their sense of humor is just drier than dirt. <laughs> well. It, it it should give, but it should, Dave. You know, you you made a valid point. It gives us an all all of us a good cause to think about what we say. And you know, there's an old adage out there that you I'm sure you remembered as a kid. It was sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It was the biggest lie that was ever told. Right. And it was, you know, it was to make us, it was to make us tough. Yeah. I mean, well, it, it, it was false then and it's false today. I, I've been hurt more by words. I, 
But there were many times I'd have brother taken the beating. The, the, or let me let me rephrase that. I'd rather have taken the appropriate corporal punishment. <clears throat> I'll make it politically correct. Then, then to have had the speech because that hurt. And, and we have to, we really, if, folk, if you're not doing it, I would highly suggest it. We need to pray over our tongues. So that whatever it is that we're saying, what, yeah, that it brings life. So that, gosh, in this day and age, it's so easy to get caught up in some of this stuff. And, and what if it's the one person that we tick off? Because, because, because of what we posted, what we said, and we tick them off, and and now, and now their point is, no, that's if that's how Christianity is, I'm done, and they're lost. Is that on our hands? Father, we are thankful tonight, God, for this opportunity to come. Lord, we love you. We desire to be closer and draw closer to you, God. Use us to advance your kingdom. Use us to advance your purpose. Use us to bring life and to fulfill your commission. Go with us, keep us safe, uh, God, in everything we do. And Lord, bring us back on Sunday, ready to receive again from you as a corporate body. In Jesus' name, amen. I may have to get a mask.